we have a meeting coming up February 28th at 6.30 p.m. here at the church for anyone that's interested in helping out with our Easter service. So we usually have, you know, the, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. It's a normal Sunday service, but we'll be looking at the, the entry into Jerusalem from Jesus. And then we're going to have a Friday night, uh, Good Friday, which we're having uh, Miranda and Alan Riggs will be sharing with us, uh, good brothers and sister in the Lord. They've been here before. She's a uh, artist, a Christian artist, been for a long time. And they are just such a blessing. So they will actually do Good Friday for us. And I think we're going to be blessed when they come out. But Easter Sunday, I'm not quite sure what the Lord wants us to do yet, whether we have a little sunrise service out there for a few of us or whether we just do our normal service with our celebration. So if you'd like to come out and um, and see what the Lord does, we're going to pray and we're going to seek him and see what he would like us to do. So that will be February 28th, 630 here at the church. All right, let's have the ushers come forward. And while they're doing that, Carlos informed me that today is the day. The money is due. Don't you hate that when you hear that word? The money is due. (laughs) It's like the bill collectors. (laughs) Youth bowling night, which is March 2nd, which is the day after the youth are meeting here at the church, a Friday. So that's next Friday they're meeting here, right, youth? Come on, all the youth say, yeah. There's only one. We have one youth here. <laughs> Carlos and the youth. <laughs> so the money's due for the, uh, bo- actually the bowling night money is, is due there. I guess you can pay there. But they need to have a, a head count. So anybody that like to go see Carlos, he was up here playing the bass. And um, he'll give you any information that you may need. But the um, night of champions, March 23rd, the money's due today because the cost is $10. After the 24th of February, it's $20. So if you can afford that, then don't worry about it. But if you'd like the break, then the money is due today. Give it to Carlos, and he'll take care of the rest for you. So that's what you need to do that. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. (sighs) You're so awesome, Lord. Your, Your grace is amazing, Father. How sweet that sound was. Lord, you would send your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, Lord. Lord, right now, we just, we ask for forgiveness, Father, for our sins, Lord. We ask that you would help us with our pride. Help us, Lord, with our anger. Lord, we just surrender these things to you, Father. And we confess them and agree with you, Lord, that they're they're definitely missing the mark, Lord. And we want to hit the mark more often, Father. And so we ask for the Holy Spirit cleanse us and wash us with the blood of Jesus, Lord. And Lord, as we now have holy hands, as the psalmist said, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, for he with holy hands. And so we use these hands to give back to you, Father. Give to your work, Father. And what you're doing here in Old Maraloma, Hoopa Valley, Father, reaching the downcast, reaching those that uh, no one else can reach, Father. And we ask you to use it for your glory. Lord, as we're collecting, that you're preparing our hearts, Father, to receive from your word, Lord, to realize, Father, who we are in Christ Jesus and how God himself dwells within us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Grab your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and an usher will get you one. If you do have a Bible, make sure that you um, have a pen and a highlighter and you want to write in your Bible. That's your Bible. God has given that to you to write in, to make notes, to jot down little references and even experiences that you experience while you're reading that scripture that can remind you next year when you read through it that, oh yeah, I remember that day and how God ministered to me. And so the Bible is the Word of God and God has something to say to every single one of us. And this morning as you're opening your Bibles, you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we'll be looking at verses 16 and 17. This morning's theme is the church, God's temple. 
the church, God's temple. We are the church, we are the body of Christ, and we are the temple of God. Solomon said that not even the highest heaven could contain God. Imagine that. The highest of heaven. And we all know how big heaven is, right? We hear all the time the stars, the galaxies, the moons. We see the pictures, and it's pretty huge. And yet, Solomon said, the highest of heavens cannot contain God, let alone the temple he has built. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Solomon realized that the temple that he was building for the Lord to dwell in <laughs> wasn't big enough. There's just no way it could contain, contain God. I just got this little picture, you know, of a, uh, a child that, that's growing out of its clothes and mama puts on the shirt and realizes, uh oh, the tummy's sticking out. You know, the arms are all kind of tight around there because the clothes just don't fit no more. And that's kind of like trying to shove God in the temple. <laughs> he just doesn't fit there, nor the heavens itself. Now, in the new covenant of grace, though, through the work of Jesus Christ, God has a holy place to dwell in. But that building is not built with material of wood, stone, precious metals. No, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of this dwelling place, and the Christians are the walls of the new holy place. That is, the Holy Spirit has made his home in us. Isn't that amazing? If the temple could not house God and the galaxies cannot contain the Lord, and yet the Lord dwells within us. That's pretty big when you think about it. It can be convicting, right? Because we realize, oh, what a wretched sinner that I am. Chief of sinners, like Paul said. Yet, it's pretty amazing that God would reside in me. He would make his home in my heart. And thank God for that, because without him in our hearts, without him in us, we could do nothing. We could not survive in this world. So that's an, an amazing thing. I don't know about you, but when we bought our first house, we were excited. We were excited to buy our first house. It, it looked like the best house on the whole block because it was our house. You know, we paid for it. We worked hard for it. We, we gathered up the down payment and we could already see it where we wanted it though it's never gotten there <laughs> but it was our house and i think that's how god feels about us wow that you are his house that he sees you and says man that's my house that's my child i just want to dwell with them in unity and in intimacy in these two verses here the apostle paul instructs the corinthians that their doctrine of division and separation is unbiblical, for we are all the temple of God. They were walking around, boasting about their ministry, about their minister, Apollo, Paul, Cephas, and they would try to make others jealous, envious of what they had or felt they had. And Paul had to come along and say, you're dividing the body of Christ. You are causing separation between one another. And that is carnal because God is one. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are one. And there is one body. And he's correcting them that we're all the temple of God. From Pentecostal to conservative Baptist, somehow, some way, God saves us all. <laughs> and hopefully we are in the middle there, and I strive to... Make sure that we are Pentecostal to a degree, and yet we're very conservative in our teaching and thought, trying to find the balance, and yet not judging our brothers on the other sides, either side, but that we're one in Christ. So in these two verses, the church is seen as the temple, and I say the church because, uh, and it's a mixture, it's a mixture of Paul saying, you know, you're as an individual, and we'll see more of that later on in Corinthians, but you as an individual house God but as the church you also house God because as we sit all here all of us together we are housing God here God is here with us among us and so I have four points in these two verses which is a lot first point is the church is the temple of God second point the spirit of God lives in the church third point judgment 
on the one who defiles the temple. And then fourth, the church is holy. The church is holy. So let's go ahead and look at verses 16 through 17, keeping the temple of God holy. Um, Let's go ahead and read it so we can read the context. It says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now my first point is the church is God's temple. And the last time we met, Paul said in verses 14 through 15, if anyone's work which he builds on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so as a church, there is a building that we're building. There is a work that is going on in the body of Christ. One of the reasons that I don't believe that God has called us to separation, to individuality. God has called us to unity and to be in one accord as a body of Christ. You cannot be an island by yourself. I think that's when you get into trouble. I mentioned it before. Uh, Brother Hank Canegraff, if if he is, and I hope he is, uh, was a great brother in the Lord, went to Calvary Chapel, a great minister, uh, able to memorize scripture like crazy. I, I've heard him quote revelation without a bible in his hand just starting in chapter one verse one and going on like wow and now he's off because he decided that he was going to pull away from the church and he's got his own ministry going on and kept it going and now he's a preterist he thinks that we're living in the millennium age you know we've gone through the tribulation already so that's air that's air and that's what happens when we go off on our own we still need a foundation we still need a church home we need a place to to be accountable to and so paul is encouraging this the corinthians here to be one and that is in the body of christ and if we are to build on the foundation of christ we must know it's the work of the holy spirit that builds let me read the amplified version my amplified version in verse for verse 16 he says do you not know you are complete Isn't that interesting? We're complete in Christ Jesus. He is what completes us because God dwells in us. Without him, we are incomplete. We're missing something. And that's why the world is always looking for something, some pleasure, some satisfaction, some status, you know, status quo of some sort because there's something void within them. But when we come to Christ Jesus, we are complete in every term. And he says, and individually, continually, that you are continually a temple of God. So it doesn't stop. You are the temple of God. He doesn't come in and out of you. (laughs) He dwells in you continually and as individuals, speaking to individuals, but yet corporately as a church. And that the Spirit of God dwells continually and is working in you. We see that in the Greek more clearly. The Spirit doesn't stop working. He is constantly working in you, continually. All the little things that go on in your life, the small little things, the things that you deal with on a regular basis, those are all things working something in you for good. So when you are encountered with a trial, when you're encountered with life situations, when you're encountered with pleasure and opportunities, these are opportunities for you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and then through you. So the church is the temple of God. Paul will later in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, speak as individual Christians being the temple. And we'll see that then. But here the emphasis is on the church as a whole. Though it has application to individuals, yet Paul here is making a point to all the Corinthians because they're separating each other. I'm of Apollo, you're of Paul. And they literally would go in the little cliques. We all see that in in churches, don't we? How many see cliques in churches? We all see cliques in churches. And those cliques need to be open uh, to others coming in and not closed off. I get it that cliques happen because just who we are as human beings, we kind of are drawn to like personalities and spirits. 
but we need to be open for others to come in and join us. When Paul calls the church a temple, don't think he is using a metaphor here, because he's not. But literally, God's dwelling is in us, and this is literally God dwelling in us. Now, I don't always feel that, right? I don't know if you, about you, but I don't always feel like God's dwelling in me, because I have my flesh with me also. And we saw that when in Romans uh, chapter 7, Paul also said, boy, the things that I struggle with and I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's the flesh. But yet there's the spirit part where God dwells in you. And in those cases, like in worship right now, you just felt the spirit. You were in the throne room of God. and The spirit was dwelling in us mightily, moving and humbling us and, and giving us the reality of his home residing in us. So what makes the church a temple? The Spirit of God dwelling in you. That's what makes it a temple. God's Spirit lives in us. The word used for temple here is naos. And it refers to the actual sanctuary, the place of the deity's dwelling. In contrast to the broader word, hieron, which has the temple area in general. So this is talking about the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies. The Dead Sea Scroll agrees with that. It also portrays God people as the building or the temple. And the image was widely known. So when Paul's readers read this, they understood exactly what Paul was saying. That he was talking about the Holy of Holies where God dwelled. Do you remember in the Old Testament? When the priests would have to go in the Holy of Holies and the sacrifices that they had to make before they even approached the Holy of Holies? Sacrifice upon sacrifice. And they needed to be right and cleansed. If they weren't and they walked into the Holy Holies, they would be consumed. Uh, tradition says that they would tie a, a rope around their feet and with little bells so they could hear them walking around in there. And if the bell stopped, they knew something happened. They'd tug on it. If nothing happened, they'd tug again. They realized he must have died due to his sin. So they would pull him out. They dare not go into the Holy of Holies, but they pulled him out. Prepare the next priest. <laughs> that would get you ready, wouldn't it? <laughs> I know it would me. And yet here we are today, God dwelling in us. And yet we're full of sin. How does, how does that work? We're full of sin. We still sin. We probably sinned on the way here. I know earlier on in, in my Christian walk when Virginia and I used to drive to church together with the boys we sinned every time we came to church quiet down be quiet we're going to church you know we get into arguments and so forth then we get into church ah, let's worship God now <laughs> so we, we realized we need to drive separately to church <laughs> no we just got busy that's why we drive separately but we sin all the time, and yet God dwells in us. How does that work then? Why is it that God can dwell in us, and yet in the Old Testament, if you walked in there with sin, He'd consume you? Grace. Jesus Christ. His righteousness. See, God has imputed His righteousness to us that God doesn't see our wickedness. No, He only sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is why He dwells in us, because Jesus' blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And that is past present and future when he said totalistai it is finished he was saying your past sins are forgiven and forgotten your sins now as as i'm here are forgiven and forgotten and your future sins will be forgiven and forgotten you are now righteous before my father's eyes that's the work of jesus christ in you and so now god can dwell in you that's an amazing work <clears throat> the greek word translated temple here speaks of the holy spirit the Holy of Holies, as I said, and part of the temple that dwells the Shekinah glory of God. That was the amazing glory that the children of Israel would look at it and go, I don't want to get close to it. It is too beautiful for me to even think I can approach that. <clears throat> there was one point in time, you remember in Exodus, where God says, tell the people not to get too close to the mountain. And they had to tell them, get just to the ridge, don't get any closer, at least you be consumed with the Shekinah glory of God. And yet now God dwells within us. So here we are, the church, which is the temple of God, because of the work of Jesus Christ, who has given us uh, that gift of grace, his righteousness. Second point, the Spirit of God lives in the church. Look at verse 16 again. 
and that the Spirit of God dwells continually and is working in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the action by which God takes up permanent residence in the body of believers in Jesus Christ. We know the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He's the silent one. Call him the silent partner. He's always pointing to Jesus. Never points to himself, guys. Never. You never see the Holy Spirit saying, look at me, look what I'm doing. No, the Holy Spirit's always pointing to Jesus. Look at what Jesus did. Look at what he's going to do. Let me tell you more about him. Always pointing to the Holy Spirit. When you get into a Pentecostal mode, the Holy Spirit won't broadcast himself. He will point to Jesus. He's not going to draw men to himself. He's going to draw men to Jesus Christ. That is his responsibility. So why does he dwell in us? So that he can draw us closer to Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. <clears throat> he empowers us. He illuminates the scriptures to us so that we may know Jesus more clearly. And so he dwells in us. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go from the Old Testament saints, empowering them for service, but not necessarily remaining on them. And that was a bummer, if you think about it. To be empowered and you get a word of the Lord and you do a great work and then next thing you know, it's like, where'd you go, Lord? <laughs> uh, now I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I don't know what to do. But today we have the Holy Spirit constantly in us who has a role to describe the truth of God. He lives with you and will be in you, John 14, 17 says. And Jesus had instructed his disciples and encouraged them and knew his disciples intimately because the Holy Spirit dwelt within them, that he, that he was going to send that helper to them to help them. Because he was going away. He would be leaving them. He was not going to leave them orphans, powerless, but he promised to leave them another one like him, and that would be the helper, John 14, 16. He was telling them that that person would help them in their daily walk. They were to go and wait in the upper room. For so many days until the Holy Spirit came upon them and then they were to go out on that day of Pentecost when the Spirit dwelt in them permanently and they went out and they were witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the rest of the world and here we are today because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is, is the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, right? Read the book of Acts. See how the Holy Spirit functions within the church itself. From the very beginning, when they began to go out into Jerusalem, preaching the gospel message, they became witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Even in light of persecution, threats, didn't care about their own lives any longer. Peter was not going to deny the Lord now because he was indwelled with the Holy Spirit. He learned his lesson. But they went out with boldness and power and began to move and turn. So much so that Stephen, who was a deacon, could, they, could be able to stand there and preach the whole dialogue of the Old Testament. And it would touch Paul's heart of planting a seed that Paul later on would be on the road to Damascus when Jesus revealed himself to him and said, Paul, why are you fighting against me? And then the apostle Paul gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's a religious man, an educated man, who had studied under Gamil and read all the books that there were, humbled himself and realized all that is nothing but dung compared to Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Guys, the bottom line is this. The Holy Spirit anoints the church with the power to be relevant in the culture. I have to ask myself, I'm the pastor of this church. Are we anointed to be relevant in the culture that we live in today? Are we relevant? Are you a part of that church and are you helping the church to be relevant in the culture and in our surroundings? I would say yes to us because we're reaching people that normally won't be reached by the church. Church doesn't oftentimes go out to homeless camps like we do and try to preach the gospel to them let alone love them unconditionally, knowing that they have their own drama and situations and struggles and problems. And yet we 
love them unconditionally. We feed over 50 to 60 every Sunday here with groceries. We reach out to them, letting them know that we love them, we care about them, showing them that this is what Christianity is about. <coughs> Not just the big lights, the great shows, you know, the wonderful screens and so forth. No, literally there in the forefront, on the ground, trying to reach people for Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do here. We want to be like the early church. And I believe we're doing that. We're reaching the culture in our community, in our area, that people feel comfortable here, that not necessarily are what we would say uh, modern Christians, but people that are trying to understand what Christianity is and might have even uh, have their thoughts of Christianity from TV or, or people that weren't great examples of it. You know, and now they're seeing, boy, these people just love us unconditionally. See, the bottom line is, guys, is that the Holy Spirit has anointed us to be a part of the church and to impact our culture through prayer, through commitment of each believer. The Spirit works out God's divine plan here. We are the body of Christ, and so we must all individually present ourselves as a part of that plan, participating with God. You see, what Paul is doing here is you guys are separated instead of united. Yeah, we're a body of Christ. We're individuals, and we are different parts of the body, but we should be working together to reach the, gospel, reach the kingdom out there with the gospel message. <coughs> That's God's plan and purpose for us to be involved. There are too many people in their own kingdom. They've built their own kingdom, doing their own thing, building their own you know, life and so forth. What does that look like? You know, well, it looks like this. I, I want to buy a house. I want to have cars. I want to have a retirement. Uh, I want that to be my kingdom, and I have to build that up. I don't have time for church because I have to take care of my family. God wants me to take care of my family, right? Yes, he does. But I don't have time for church. I don't have time to be involved. I don't See, that's God's kingdom is finding time, figuring it out, cutting here, sacrificing. Believe me, it's a lot of sacrificing. I work for um, Southern California Edison, and sometimes I would work <laughs> three days in a row. <coughs> Most of the time, I'd work at 12 to 17 hours a day. We took vacation twice a year. A <coughs> couple of weeks here and there. We missed, we missed a lot of family events, a lot of family gatherings, a lot of Christmases, because we're here ministering the gospel to other people that need to hear it. Uh, we missed family nights. Uh, we missed, you know, birthdays of cousins and aunts and various things like that. You have to cut somewhere. You cut somewhere. We took our vacations, but we didn't take our vacations at other points. So there's sacrifices. Uh, if you want to build your kingdom, you know, you go right ahead. God's given you grace, and, and he's, you know, unconditionally loves you no matter what. You can build your kingdom, and you'll go to heaven. Or you can sacrifice some things. Let's sacrifice. Let's cut here, and let's not do this. Let's not do that. Let's get involved here, you know. We didn't watch TV as much. The programs that were out there, people would mention programs like I don't know what program that is. <laughs> I don't watch that. So the sacrifice of being involved because God's plan is to reach the world that's lost. And so we must all individually present ourselves to the plan of God. So third point. The spirit lives in the church. Third point is judgment on the one who defiles the temple of God. Look at verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That's a little scary, <laughs> especially if you go back to the Old Testament. And, and Paul is referring to the Old Testament here. Can you think of some people that were in the temple and defiled it? And what happened to them? <clears throat> we recently went over in Leviticus in the earlier parts of the chapter. Remember Aaron's two sons? They offered up strange fire in the temple and God judged them. Anyone who defiles the temple of God, God says he'll destroy them. Paul is continuing with his thought of not being separated, but being united as the church with a warning here. Let me read my amplified version. Verse 17 says, if any man continues 
to destroy the temple. So this is a continual action. This is a guy that, that, that has it out for the church. That for whatever reason, he's just trying to destroy it. Uh, he might think that, that it's a good work that he's doing because the pastor's a bad guy and I've got to show everyone that he's a bad guy. Or they're not doing this the right way and I need to make sure that everyone knows that this isn't done the right way. I remember years ago, a guy, um, <clears throat> guy told me, uh, he says, you shouldn't be in the ministry full time. And I'm like, okay, why is that? He goes, well, I've gone to Bible college. And in Bible college, they told us that you shouldn't be in ministry full time until you have 500 people. And I thought, okay. Well, he wasn't going to let that happen because he made sure that he divided the church <laughs> as much as he could. And my question was, well, where does it say that in the Bible? Can you point that out anywhere for me where it says 500 people and then you can go full time? Because as far as I remember, I, I remember Peter and them. God's just saying, you're now full time, Matthew. Leave your work, come to church <laughs> and you're working full time. See, they got this idea because someone said instead of going to the Bible, be more biblical. So it's a person that is looking to destroy the church, taking every opportunity, not just something that someone does, you know accident or because they're sinful and they didn't mean to do it and their flesh just kind of flared up. No, this is someone that continues to destroy the temple of God. And then it says God will destroy each occurrence progressively on him. So he's not talking about damnation here. He's talking about destroying the things that he's doing progressively, punctually. So every time he does something, God will destroy it. Or God will destroy something in him. His effectiveness. His family. Relationships. People will realize. You know, you lie one time to someone and guess what? You've lost their trust. Because you don't know if they're telling the truth or not anymore. So God says he'll destroy every occurrence that you're trying to destroy his temple. For the temple of God is holy. And that is what you are continually. He says you are continually holy holy before the Lord. And again, how are we holy? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you defile the church, God will destroy your witness, right? He will destroy your witness. And that's a sad place to be. Your candle is not lit anymore. God's temple, his church is holy and it matters to God how we treat the holy temple of God. And what are the things that defile the temple? That is the body of Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Just write in your Bible a couple of chapters. And I just want to quickly just show you here. I'm going to read the whole thing. But when you read chapter 5, you'll understand what he was talking about here. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. This is in the Corinthian church. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what is Paul talking about? You're destroying the temple of God by the things that you're doing. And he says, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. I mean, they weren't even upset. They're like, oh, OK, yeah, we know that. You know, yeah, we know so-and-so doing that. Yeah, but we just kind of you know, turn the eye and just kind of want to look at it. You don't even mourn for it, he said, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed am absent in the body, but present in the spirit. I have already judged as though I were present concerning him who has done this deed. I mean, Paul went on to say that I prayed that God would take his body, that his spirit would be saved. This is a believer who's acting worse than a non-believer. And Paul's saying, boy, I'm not there, but if I was there, boy, would I let you have it. But I'm there in spirit, and so I'm praying that God would take his body, her body, and destroy it, m kill both of them, so that their spirits would go to heaven. Now, he's making a judgment call there, guys, right? And we are to judge, especially in that kind of heinous sin. So we see what Paul is talking about here, about destroying the body of Christ. It's sin that we allow to enter into the church. It destroys, it permeates, it leavens the whole lump. And so we need a church that is holy. For my fourth point and last the church is to be holy. Look at the next statement in, in verse 17. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, was the temple of Solomon holy? 
when Solomon built that temple and it was beautiful, David had prepared all the material and all the resources and gave more than three quarters of his resources to this temple because he loved God so deeply. Did that make the temple of God holy or did God set the temple apart as holy because he dwelled in it? What made the temple holy? It was because God set it apart and his Shekinah glory fell upon the temple. So it was God making the temple holy. God was the one who sanctified, set it apart. Just as we see the church today, that it is Jesus Christ's redemptive and sanctifying work in us that makes us holy. And Christians understand the holiness of the whole church is derived from the holiness of Jesus Christ. We take on His holiness and not our own holiness. Uh, back in the 80s, I'm not sure if it's going around as much anymore, but I remember hearing back in the late 80s uh, a teaching that was going around saying that you can, be, you can be sinless. You can actually be sinless. And I remember this teaching clearly because I thought, wow, I, I want to be sinless, Lord. I hate sinning against you. <laughs> Every time I sin, I feel so bad, like I've hurt you and hurt our relationship, and I don't want to sin against you. So I paid close attention to this guy, and he says, you can be sinless. You know, you, if you live a month at a time, uh, you're going to sin. But if you live a day at a time, you know you're going to sin less. You just try to live 24 hours rightly before God. And then if you, if you just think about an hour at a time, then you'll sin even less. And I thought, that makes sense. And I thought, wow, he went to the point of just live a second at a time. Every second, just be holy, and you can be holy without sin. And I thought, that's the way to do it. And then I realized the next day I failed. <laughs> There's just no way you can do that. <laughs> There's no way you can do that. There's a thought. There's pride. Uh, there's all kinds of things that c pop into your head. And you're like, wow, I messed up. Okay, let's get back to the second, Lord. <laughs> you know, and then you're now concentrated on just the second and you realize you can't. That's why John, the apostle, wrote in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins... You know, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Why would he write that if, if you were holy? And the guy pulled it out of 1 John also and said that you can actually walk a holy life. You can't. You just can't. Well, so what makes us holy? Jesus Christ. It's his holiness. It's his holiness. So we walk by faith, right? We walk by faith. We believe that we are holy, though we know we're not. But we believe we're holy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that changes everything for us. So, and I'm not saying in a sense you ignore your sin because you have to deal with it immediately. You confess it and then you forget it, but you move on. But you're holy before the Lord because of the work of Jesus Christ. And that's hard to live and understand and grasp because every time you sin, you want to you wanna somehow figure out, figure out how I cannot do that. You can't. That's the work of Jesus Christ. You have to give that to him. And ultimately, he will take it away from you. So Christians understand the holiness of the whole church is derived from the holiness of Jesus Christ. And the church is holy because God is holy and the church shares in God's own uh, holy life. Now, despite the regrettable disunity we see in the church today, and there is, we just have to be truthful, the church is not in unity today uh, by far. All who believe the gospel are one in Jesus Christ today. That's what the Bible teaches. Because of the divisions that we see today, I think that we lack our witness to the world. Because you'll have someone look at us and say, you guys can't even get your stuff together. You know, Here you are, Baptist and Lutheran and Methodist, and you guys can't even agree on what you want to be. First Baptist, Second Baptist, Reformed Baptist, True Baptist, you're right, you know, it's like, shh. so why should I become a Christian? And then they go into church and people are talking and backbiting and gossiping. It's like, man, I'm sitting here new to this and I hear all this. I'm like, I could just go to my sewing club and do the same thing. The church has to be holy. It has to be holy. We have to represent Christ as best as we can. Yes, we're going to fail. We're going to fall short. 
but we're still the body of Christ. Uh, and that is definitely understood. <clears throat> that person may not understand it at that moment. And if they continue to come to church and grow and read their Bible, then they will understand that I've joined the sinful church just as a sinner. <laughs> I don't want to join that church because it's hypocrisy. Well, join us. You know, the hypocrites join us because we're all living hypocrisy at times. Uh, not all the time, but every so often there's a thing of hypocrisy that pops up in our lives, so we're all as guilty. We've missed the mark, right? God has a standard, and we missed it. But we are the body of Christ in, this, in the New Testament, and he dwells within us. The church is called in the Bible, one body in Christ, Romans 12, 5. One body in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Ephesians 4, 12. The body in Hebrews 13, 13. The church is clearly compared with the body in Ephesians 5.23 and Colossians 1.24. We are the body of Christ. And, he, and Paul compares it to like our bodies or the body of Jesus Christ. That we are one, but yet individual in all kinds of ways. I was sharing that at one of our devos. And by the way, you can listen to us every, every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. Just join my... Be my friend on Facebook, and you'll see that we have a Devo every morning for a half an hour. Some of us meet here, and we fellowship and pray afterwards, or some watch. And I shared about the body of Christ. I recently hurt my arm, and you don't realize how much you need an arm until you've hurt your arm. You know, because, you, you know, your limbs are functioning correctly. You don't realize. You just do things normally. But as soon as you hurt your arm, you go, oh, I can't. I can't lift my arm. Now I can't grab things with it. You know, I can't lean on this side anymore. I've got to lean on the other side. And so here's the body of Christ, and it feels one part that's hurting. So I was doing this for a while. I was grabbing my arm and lifting it up and, <laughs> you know, dropping it on the, on the table or whatever, trying to stretch it, using my other arm. And that's what the body of Christ should do. It should come along and say, you need some help for a while until you get healed, until you feel better. But you don't realize that until it, you hurt something. But the body of, of Christ is a body, but yet it's individually. And individually, it can hurt. It can be an error. It could be crippled. But we're still the body of Christ and very powerful. Let me share with you this truth in Psalms. You might want to turn there, Psalms 133. <clears throat> David wrote very clearly. He realized it how important it is to be in unity, though when you look at his life, he was not in unity, was he? With the kingdom, with Saul, with his sons, his family, he was t totally disarrayed of unity at all. <laughs> and yet he realized how important it was to be in unity. Psalms 133, verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in I don't know, there's just something about unity that's just so pleasant. It just, it just brings such a good feeling when you're in unity. And it's that unity that causes great things, right? When a football team is in unity, you can't stop them. Quarterback, you know, the line, the defense, coaches, they're all in unity. They all got it. They're all working together. They understand their, their places, their roles, and they're doing it at 110%, and boom, you can't stop them. That's why the Rams lost. <laughs> they weren't in unity. They got beat by a better team that was in unity. We, we see that. We get in our little cliques, you know, and people that we get along, and we're in unity. We're like-minded, and we're working together, and we laugh, and we have fun, and it's just, it just passes time. You're like, man, I really like that. But you get in a group that there's no unity. You're like, I don't want to be here. There's no unity there. So... David understood that there's something good and pleasant about dwelling together in unity. And so we should strive for unity in the body of Christ. He goes on in verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garment. The anointing, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Aaron's the high priest. And, and it is such, they, they view that as an awesome event. Children of Israel, millions of them, standing by as Aaron was being anointed. 
to enter into the Holy of Holies. Why is that so exciting? Because Aaron gets to go in there, offer up a sacrifice so that God's wrath would not be on Israel. That's pretty exciting. That he would lead them in grace and in mercy. And so it's beautiful. It's like that unity of the Holy Spirit falling upon Aaron and Aaron fulfilling and being obedient to what God has asked him to do so that Israel would be presentable to God. And then verse 3 says, It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessings, life forevermore. Notice that he didn't say cursings. Isn't that interesting? He said blessings. Because God wants blessings for us and not cursing. And blessings come by obedience, by surrender and brokenness in our lives. And God wants to bless us in our relationships, with our families, with our neighbors, in our community, where we work. He wants to bless us with peace and rest. He wants you to have rest. He wants you to be at peace. Matthew says it very clearly in 11. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rome, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. 29. God wants blessings on us. He wants to give you a blessing today. He wants you to have rest today. So as we bow our heads, I pray you just surrender your lives to him. Whatever you're dealing with, give it to him. Let him have it. He's more than able. He is capable. He's God. Uh, he divided the Red Sea. He created the heavens and the earth so he can handle that. Especially if you can't handle it. And you're making things worse, then you're really just hurting yourself. So just give it to him. Let him handle it. Forget it. Leave it alone. Don't even think about it. That's his. Here it is, God. You take it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to be faithful to the things I can do, like read your word, prayer, be in church, serve, love my family, do those things that he's called you to do, and let him have the rest. And you'll find that peace that surpasses all understanding. Let's pray. And if you want that rest and peace, I want you just to stand up, and I want to pray for you. Those of you that are in the courtyard, just go ahead and stand. God sees you. And I want to pray for peace for you right now. I want to pray for wisdom to handle the things that you're going through right now. We're the church, and we're supposed to pray for one another. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all those that are standing, Lord. They're, they're just saying, Lord, from their hearts, Lord, here I am. I'm agreeing with my brother, with your word, Lord. We just want to acknowledge you as God and just give you that place in our lives that you have everything in control. And you say you work all things out for good, Lord. All things. Even when it's all f our fault, Lord, <laughs> you work it out for good, Lord. Whew, thank you, Lord. And we just desire peace right now, Lord. We surrender what the, the things that we're going through, Lord. Whatever it is that we are dealing with, Father, it could be ourselves. We, we're our worst enemies, Lord. And we can be battling ourselves in our heads, thinking one way and trying to figure out another. And, and Lord, we need to just let it go. Not overthink it, Lord. We trust in you, Father. May you just let your peace fall upon us, Lord God. We are the body of Christ, Lord. We are the church. Make us effective in our culture, Lord. Bring a peace, Lord, that surpasses all understanding, Lord, that we may be in unity and effective, Father, in these last days, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, as we believe by faith name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we'll close with this song. I am forgiven because you were forsaken. I am accepted.